Welcome to our next session uh, webinars. And um, today our session is on uh, tank design, or reservoir design, and it will be presented by Mr. David Perrett. Uh, thank you for joining us. This is, should be a very interesting session. I think it's a subject which is uh, poorly understood. Uh, there's some new technology and uh, a lot of interesting things that you'll see uh, during the webinar today. And uh, I, I hope you'll enjoy it. I certainly am. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Keane. Uh, my name is David Perrett, and uh, thank you very much for attending. So the topic of today is all reservoirs and some design principles, and uh, we're touching on a few different things on how they how they work, what to keep in mind when designing a reservoir or looking at a new system or an existing system, and uh, yeah, let's get into it. The general topics today is, as I've said, the functions common design features and some differences between mobile hydraulic and lubrication systems. Now, I want to preface this with uh, just saying that this is a very large topic. There's a lot of work that can go into correct reservoir design. Uh, my goal today is to just have a brief overview of the topic, a um, couple of my experiences and, and tips and traps to look out for. And uh, so hopefully everyone will leave the uh, webinar today being a little little better off and a little uh, more knowledgeable on the topic. So functions and, and misconceptions on reservoirs. So uh, that's a list of the, the points I'll be covering. So everyone knows fluid storage for reservoirs, obviously um, somewhere to keep the oil for your system, but we'll go into a little more detail than that. Mixing of your operating fluid, deaeration, and settling of contaminants are all very uh, interrelated topics. Um, obviously, providing mounting locations for components, if anyone's seen a high box, will uh, be aware of that one. And heat dissipation is uh, a bit of a controversial one. We'll cover that a little bit too. So moving on to fluid storage. Uh, so this is always a bit of a difficult one, in my opinion, when it comes to a new system, particularly uh, if there's not quite enough information. But an important point to remember with this is if your system has multiple pumps, um, that rule of thumb must apply to the total flow rate of the reservoir, not just an individual pump on the system. Um, more, uh, more to the point, you also need to consider differential volumes. Now, you see on this uh, slide here, we've got a cylinder and an accumulator. Both of these things have one thing in common, and that is during operation, they draw oil from the tank and lower your oil level. So it might be good and well to, to use a rule of thumb to get a tank sizing, but if you're using a 100-litre uh, tank on a cylinder with a differential volume of 50 or 60 litres or some other example like that, then you're going to run into trouble. It needs to be considered. And uh, dwell time for oil inside the reservoir is also very important. We'll uh, touch on that a little bit later when we're talking in de-aeration. De so mixing uh, is a good first topic. Now you'll see on the picture I've put up on the right hand side of the slide that is a very specifically uh, designed tank uh, for, with a single purpose in mind that is uh, to have an example of extremely good fluid mixing you can see the oil coming in from the bottom left has to travel all the way uh, down to the end of the tank and back before it can reach the other side uh, where the pump suction would be the purpose of this long baffle and long tank design is purely for mixing uh, the Colored images on the bottom right is actually an oil velocity and oil path analysis done on this tank design uh, to show exactly how well it works. Obviously, the red is a higher velocity and a uh, blue is a lower velocity. Now, why go to all this trouble? Well, first and foremost, um, in smaller tanks, particularly if you've got higher flow rates, you can get something called flow channeling. And what flow channeling is when the oil returns into your tank through your return filter, it can seek a pathway directly to the pump suction. And if there's nothing there, no, no geometry, no features, no baffling to force mixing, uh, then essentially the volume of oil in your system is reduced down to just what's in that channel between the return filter and the suction. So uh, it's all good and well if you've got a large tank, but if you're only really mixing about 20 litres of oil between those two points, then any deoration, any, any uh, temperature increase or contaminants you've got coming in through your return line, if it's not removed some way or another, will be just going in a loop for throughout your system, not taking advantage of the full volume of the tank. Thermal shock is another uh, particularly dangerous um, thing that can happen to your hydraulic system. Now, to give an example of, of where this can happen, uh, if you've got a power pack that, say, is, is operating in a, in a nice 30-degree ambient condition, 
delivering oil into, for example, a, a uh, chilled uh, or refrigerated uh, room, maybe in the in the food or uh, meat processing kind of industries, where the temperature can be quite low. You can even be below zero in negative 10, negative 15 degrees. What can happen is the oil that is sitting static in that chilled environment, when it returns back to the, the tank, it's still very cold. It's, it's still 30, 40, maybe more degrees different to the temperature of the pump. And if you've got that flow channeling happening or you don't have correct mixing, then your pump's going to get a, uh, a dose of this extremely cold oil and seize um, a very quick way to, to kill a pump where proper mixing um, will prevent this from happening. As it it uh, causes the oil, the cold oil coming in to be mixed throughout the tank, bringing the average temperature a little more predictable for the pump. So any temperature change is a gradual process. And assisting with deaeration, um, that's leading into the next topic. But uh, of course, if you have a flow channel and you have hair, heavily aerated oil, uh, the oil doesn't have as much surface area of the tank for the air bubbles to settle out to. Whereas if the oil is mixing throughout the entire volume of the tank, you've got the full surface area for air bubbles to float up to the top of the tank and uh, exit the oil. Moving on, so uh, to go further into deaeration, they've got a lovely picture there of a purposefully aerated tank, just to show what it looks like from the, uh, the sides. You don't normally see that in the tank. You only see the top, of course. So uh, in trained air, um, air bubbles inside your hydraulics is, is a particularly uh, bad problem to have in a hydraulic system for many reasons. Um, cavitation first and foremost. So for those of you who may not be familiar with the topic of cavitation, traditionally uh, cavitation is described as air bubbles forming in the suction of your pump because of poor suction conditions where it can go into vacuum. And the bubbles, or gas bubbles, I should say, then pass through the pump and collapse or implode on the high pressure side. Uh, this can cause uh, severe damage to anything in the hydraulics, the pump itself or any components immediately after. Now, the truth of this situation is it's not just vacuum conditions that cause this. If you've got air already in your oil, already in your tank, then they do the exact same thing when they go from low to high pressure. Dieseling in cylinders, uh, so a very similar process. If you have the oil throughout your system and it, it can tend to collect inside actuators like cylinders and you end up with a large air pocket up near, say, the gland or, or somewhere else. And then when you go through a pressure cycle with that cylinder, the air bubble will collapse and it'll combust. It'll, it'll, it'll reach extremely high temperatures, damaging your oil, damaging your cylinder. It can even melt the seals and lead to seal failure. Um, pretty severe problem when it does happen. Spongy actuators. Um, I'm sure a lot of people who have done any work on a hydraulic system, particularly a mobile system, after a commissioning has gone to drive something like a um, like a, a manually controlled valve, and it just it doesn't re respond as it should. It, it's slow to react. The cylinders don't move at their full speed straight away, or they don't reach end of stroke properly. Um, this is what happens when you have air inside your oil. So, an important point is. When you have your air mixed in, you're no longer dealing with a near incompressible fluid, which is your mineral oil. You're dealing with a, a mixed fluid now. The air changes your viscosity, it changes your compressibility. It changes the, the nature of what you're dealing with. And this is really felt when you're, you're dealing with the valves or control valves or anything else that relies on the near incompressible nature and the lubricity of oil. So unexpected valve behavior is another, another byproduct of having severely aerated oil where your hydraulics will just simply not work as it should. The air gets in the wrong spot and stops our uh, valves from working as they, as they are expected to. All of this leads to something I like to call spiral of death. Um, so once, once your oil is no longer a homogenous oil and it's no longer incompressible, it's no longer as, uh, it's not providing the lubricity it should, the viscosity has changed because of the air bubbles. Um, you get a temperature increase in your system. You know, your cooler doesn't work properly. There's greater friction through your pumps, through your valves, which leads to a further temperature increase. This whole process snowballs. It, 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 uh, once it starts, it can spiral out of control, leading to an early, early failure of your system. So uh, I think these points make it a, a severe enough topic to uh, get everyone's attention and, and think about it when they're talking about tank design. Obviously, building your system to get the air out of the oil is a, it's a major point. Now, I thought uh, that I would show a little bit of an interesting video uh, to those of you who have not seen it. Um, the question is, of course, how does air get into my oil? I don't have air in my oil right now. Well, 
The truth is, air is often dissolved in your oil. Up to ten percent with uh, fresh oil can be can be dissolved air. This example is using water, but what we have here is a flow of water. It's not a great flow rate or high differential pressure going across a valve. And just from that pressure drop going from high to low, you can see the air bubbles coming out of the valve and shooting downstream out of the oil and shooting uh, water and shooting downstream. The exact same thing happens in a hydraulic system. And if it's severe enough, those air bubbles do continue off into the rest of your system, into your reservoir or anywhere else where they can cause damage. So quite a large topic. And this is what it looks like. So anyone watching has not seen cavitation damage. The lens plate on a piston pump, um, this is what cavitation damage does. It's on a small level. It, it, it starts to rip the material out of the walls of the components in, in, in the pump or the hydraulic system where the cavitation is occurring. Leads to a very quick failure of your hydraulics. So then the question is, all right, you've got a concern about air inside your oil, what can you do about it? First and foremost, tank design is very important. Um, the, on the left, you'll see a tank design with this purpose in mind. The oil is returning in on, on the right-hand side uh, here. It's traveling around the baffle until it reaches a perforated angled mesh sheet, uh, a diffuser sheet, before it can go back into the suction. Now, the purpose of designs like this is first off mixing, as the oil is traveling around the tank and having time to mix and, and allow the air bubbles to get to the top of the tank. But also once they reach a mesh sheet or a, or a perforated sheet, the air bubbles tend to collect and tend to uh, follow the sheet up to the surface of the oil. So things like this are, are important to consider whether it's whether you need to do it in your tank design. The other on the right hand side, you can see some HIDAC patent, uh, patent uh, filter elements that achieve the exact same purpose. The oil comes in through the return into the top of the filter and when it comes out through the sides of so those mesh sides, um, it does two big things. First off, the velocity of the oil entering into your tank is slowed down greatly. The oil is dispersed in all directions at a low velocity. Secondly, air bubbles tend to collect and uh, combine into larger air bubbles on the mesh where they will float up to the surface um, much faster than, say, a small air bubble coming in at high velocity. With these filter elements, you can achieve flow rates of 100, 150 litres a minute in, in a very small housing with absolutely no, no aeration issues there. Very effective. Settling of contaminants um, is another major feature, particularly in lubrication systems where you have a large uh, volume of oil, you've got a high amount of contaminants, may come back from your mill or whatever system you're working with. And uh, it, in these situations, typically the best thing for the oil after it goes through return filters is to have dwelling time inside the tank. And dwelling time is purely for the purpose of allowing air to, to go to the surface, as, as I mentioned, and also for any contaminants left in the, in the oil to settle to the bottom of the tank so they're not pulled across into the pump suction and sent off to the rest of the system that's being lubricated. Now, uh, uh, one way you can do this is in the little diagram I've drawn there, having a, a uh, large baffle in the center, having a dirty side and a clean side, separating out your, your return and your suction. But it's also common practice these days to put in an offline filtration circuit and cooling circuit, uh, basically for oil polishing. And if you do it right, you pull from the dirty side, you filter and, and cool your oil, and you return to the clean side with a higher flow rate than the, the system demand. And what this does is you now have a backflow of clean oil going from the clean side to the dirty side. So the freshly returned uh, oil that may have contaminant or bubbles in it never actually reaches the suction of your, your pump that's delivering to the rest of your system. Clever or good design principles like this make a very large difference in how well uh, uh, your lubrication or hydraulic system will work for the rest of, it, of the uh, plant's life. On to component mounting. I've uh, included a picture here of a pretty pretty extreme example of how much you can bolt onto the top, top of a tank lid, but uh, that's the, the meaning of this topic. If you've seen high boxes or any other very compact hydraulic power units, you can see that the, the tank itself is, is a useful uh, method of mounting valves or um, pump uh, the pump and motor set, filtration, gauges, it can all be achievable. Of course, um, serviceability needs to be kept in mind and, and making sure you can actually access the tank to do your work, but um, it's a very useful purpose. Heat dissipation. Now, this is one of the misconceptions uh, I wanted to cover. 
as a particularly a bit of an old school thing um, that, that you'll hear is that people will rely on the reservoir itself and heat radiating from the sides of reservoir to cool off the oil. Um, I'd like to challenge that. I've got a, a graph I've found here as, as, a, as a as a rule of thumb kind of general representation of what kind of, of heat loss you can get from a tank. This is, of course, assuming a average kind of ratio of sizes for the tank to the volume, but nothing too extreme. Clean, clean tank, good airflow, that, that kind of situation. Now, if we've got a seven and a half kilowatt power pack, and so we've got 68 weight oil, and we're trying to keep a target temperature of 50 degrees uh, with one and a half kilowatt heat removal to get a viscosity of 43. So we've got our target viscosity that must be maintained. Now, in this example here, we would end up with a tank of 490 litres to do one and a half kilowatt cooling. That is a very large tank for a seven and a half kilowatt power pack. And we have no control over the viscosity or the, the temperature of the oil in a tank. If we're on a hot day, the temperature goes up, your viscosity goes down. This, this, uh, it's just not a reliable method. So uh, my, the point I wanna make here is in systems, uh, particularly when you have uh, a target viscosity in mind, which is pretty much all systems, just use a cooler. It's the, it's the most reliable way of doing this, relying on the tank to, the tank to disperse uh, the heat accumulating in your system is just not a good method. Poll time, everyone. So uh, see if everyone's been listening. I've got an example hydrostatic system, a closed loop system, uh, as you can see here, with a uh, normal, you know, the uh, closed loop pump and motor setup with a charge pump and an auxiliary pump leading to a control valve and a cylinder. What value should we use when we're trying to determine the reservoir sizing? What flow rate should we use? The loop flow rate, charge pump flow rate, auxiliary pump, or the total flow rate from the tank? We'll have a, a review of the answer to this at the end of the, of the presentation, but uh, please give it a thought and, and make your selection. So uh, on to differences between the uh, different kinds of power packs and tanks that you see. So I've got a few pictures on here that I think make a, a good visual representation. So hydraulic power packs, there's a very large amount of, of, of variation in what you see. Anything from a small uh, aluminium tanked high box up to a very large multiple motor, multiple pump system. So when we're talking reservoir design, I think that there's a lot of, a lot of possibilities that can be there, uh, whether, you, whether it is something small enough to have just a standard tank or whether it needs to be a fully custom engineered solution. Lubrication systems, Typically, very large reservoir to flow rate uh, ratio. You know, see a lot of large connections on the tank. Um, pretty serious baffling and deaeration uh, is often required. Um, that example picture I've got there had a flow rate of 30 liters a minute. Just the size of the volume of the oil and, and required uh, to make sure that the oil delivered to the end user, which in this case I think was a three uh, megawatt uh, bearing uh, electric motor bearing, to do it properly can be quite a serious setup. So I think it's a very good example of where you can end up. Now, mobile systems, generally, mobile systems also see a lot of uh, variation, but in a different style. In the example on the bottom right, you can see a very customized tank just to minimize space in the vehicle that it's installed to. Got a cooler built in place, got filtration there. Uh, generally, you see a more of a vertical design in your reservoir. This is done to prevent uh, splashing or sloshing or oil getting up into the breather of the tank, which is less of a problem in, in other systems elsewhere. So I guess after saying all that, it, it ends in the topic of when, when do you need a custom design reservoir or when is a standard solution appropriate? Now, generally speaking, I would recommend a custom design when we're talking about extreme conditions, high ambient temperatures, large amounts of ingress. Um, an important point here is what operating fluid you're dealing with as well, because uh, oils ain't oils is, is a saying, and uh, different oils behave completely differently. Um, lubrication oils behave differently to hydraulic oils, uh, more your, your normal power pack oils and how they handle deaeration, especially if you start talking about phosphate esters or other other different operating mediums as well. That needs to be considered how they're going to behave. If you're talking very high power or high duty cycle uh, systems where the heat load in the tank is going to be pretty significant, then you will need something that has the in internal baffling and correct mixing to handle the, the temperature. And if you're talking something that's not standard, so additional ports or mounting or, or large volumes of oil, then I'd suggest. But for all other systems, um, off the shelf solutions are perfectly acceptable. So Paul time, we'll have a look at uh, how, the, how everyone went. Most people answered total flow rate from the, the uh, reservoir, which is the correct answer. Um, in this case here, I know the tendency is to just talk about the charge pump because that is the traditional answer. 
and uh, is often very correct. But if you've got any other uh, consumers in your circuit or other pumps which will be contributing to the flow rate of your tank, you need to take them into consideration as well. Uh, as you would have the risk of, of having a very, very sloshed and mixed up tank or, or having issues with uh, inadequate oil even. Um, that is it for me. Thank you very much for listening. We've got a couple of questions which I'll just have a look at. When do you select and use a diffuser on return filters? So that's a, that's a very good question. A diffuser is necessary when you've got allowable, allowable space for a diffuser. When mixing is not going to be 100% and you've got a concern of, of flow channels and when you perhaps have a very high amount of air returning into your system. Going back to whether your system is uh, perhaps beyond just a normal high box solution, which I'm guessing is where this, this kind of uh, question is coming. So if you have got heavy amounts of air entering, entering into your system, if you've got um, space for a diffuser plate, if you can allow that into your system, then I think it's good to look into a diffuser. Second question, when using a baffle to wear the oil, should this, the design of the fee at the top edge to allow oil pass through the middle portion rather than splashing over the edge to complete the length of the baffle? Yeah, so ideally with baffles, uh, if they can go the full width of the tank is the uh, correct solution. So the concern is with, uh, with having a V or having a uh, design where you do not have a consistent uh, flat edge across the top of the oil level, uh, is you may get the, the oil concentrating through that V and the, the, the goal of having the turbulence and mixing in your tank will be defeated. You will not get the expected performance that you want. Um, so I would recommend uh, maintaining a flat topped baffle uh, unless there is some ex other external reason causing you to, to have to modify it to make sure it does its job correctly. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for watching, everyone. I hope it's been an interesting experience for everyone who's uh, attended, and um, I'll pass you back now to Mr. King. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, it was really very, very interesting, and I think that uh, you know, we look at tanks and reservoirs as a very simple uh, way of just uh, holding our fluid, and uh, when you go deeply into it, you realise that it is so much more, and it's an extremely critical part of the system design. And I think that uh, through today's webinar, that's been uh, really clearly demonstrated. Uh, certainly, we always at HiDate look for opportunities to improve designs, uh, to improve the reliability of the system. And uh, that means going into every detail. And uh, this is, uh, again, a good example of where uh, simple things uh, can be most important to the effectiveness of a good, good design system. So yeah, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have, and we look forward to see you again soon at the next webinar. Bye for now.